Welcome to your first tutorial where we'll be taking a look at your part for Paganini's Caprice number 24. Now this is usually played by a solo violinist, so that means that there are normally no other people playing apart from that one violin player. Now this version we're going to be looking at for the Benedetti Sessions, which has been arranged by the Ayub sisters, is for string orchestra. So that's first violins, second violins, violas, cellos and double basses, so it's really exciting. Now some of you might have played in an orchestra of some sort before, some of you might not have, so here are my three top tips for playing in an orchestra. <laughs> So the first top tip I'm going to give you is to make sure you've listened to the piece or a version of it before you start practicing it, um, or if not, ideally before your first rehearsal. Doing this will help you to get a feeling of how your part fits in. Top tip number two is to write your fingerings in your part. This will just help remind you of them during rehearsals so you can relax and enjoy playing. And my final top tip, top tip number three, is to make sure that you're always listening in the rehearsals, especially when you come to put it all together. So when all the strings are there, it's really important to listen to the other parts, to keep your ear on what the viola's doing, what the first violins are doing, what the double basses are doing. Just keep your ears open all the time because for an orchestra to play really well together, everybody needs to be listening really well to each other. So let's get started on the Paganini. We're going to start from the very beginning. So in your parts, you will see it says eight clicks intro. Now that means you'll hear eight clicks before anyone plays. Then you'll notice, and I'm sure you'll recognize, the first violin theme, which is the famous theme from the Paganini Caprice. Now we have eight bars rest before we come in, so make sure you really count those bars rest, okay? Because it's really important. Don't rely on other people to count, it's just because somebody else might make a mistake. So it's really important that you yourself count those bars rest so you know when you're coming in. Now, we've got these dots above and below the notes. They're called staccato. Staccato means short notes, so we need to play the notes really short. So don't use too much bow, like this. Now, that will help for the whole of that opening section, and indeed a lot of this piece, you don't need to use too much bow. But especially with staccato, you need to use short bows. And small movements with the arm. Now, let's also take a note of the dynamics. So at the beginning, we've got a P, which is piano, so it means softly. Now I would suggest pianos being played near the fingerboard, like this. Now, a bit later on you've got a mezzo forte. Mezzo forte is medium loud, and then obviously when you see an F, that's forte, which means loud. So for your mezzo fortes and fortes, I would suggest playing near with a bridge, like this. Just gives a more powerful, gutsy sound. Now, the thing that's difficult about playing near the bridge, and this is for everyone, it doesn't matter where you are in your cello journey, it's hard for everyone, is to relax when playing near the bridge, because it's actually quite hard to get a big sound out near the bridge. So try not to force the sound. Try not to grab the bow and go like that, because you'll get a loud noise, but it won't be a very very surround, circular noise. So what I suggest, you drop your right arm to the side, you lift it up and you drop it onto the bow. Really make sure you can feel 
that your arm is relaxed and that your hand feels, feels free. Then you pop the bow on the string, nearer the bridge, doesn't have to be right on the bridge, but nearer the bridge, sink into the sound. And you get a nice surround sound, the strings vibrating nicely, and that applies to any time you need to play near the bridge. So taking a look at variation one now, you'll see that underneath the notes, you've got some funny looking symbols, <laughs> which look like the letter V on their side. They're called accents, and accents are basically notes with a bit more oomph, a bit more welly to them. So I would suggest playing them with a little bit more bow. Um, so let's just give that a go. So remember, relaxed arm, you can really feel that you've got a good contact with the string and then we're going to go. So remember oomph and a bit more bow. Now another thing I'm just going to point out about this section is in bar 33 you've got two down bows written. So um, just in case you don't know, down bows are those half squares and up bows are the normal Vs. <laughs> so just to clarify, accents are the Vs on their side that you usually see above or beneath the notes and up bows are normal Vs. They look like normal Vs. So the down bows we've got are two A down bows. Now what I'd suggest you do is that you just make sure you get back to the start of the bow. I always call this bit the frog, um, but you, your teacher might have a different name for it, I don't know. But when I say the frog, I mean this area, so when you put the bow here. So you've got... So you just want to make a nice, quite quick, circular motion with the arm to get back to the frog. So. Now I was taking a bit more time there, there's obviously not that much of a gap between the notes, but practice it a little bit slowly and then speed it up. And remember not too much bow, because otherwise if you end up out here you're going to have to do a massive movement to get back and that will be too slow. So. So moving on to variation two, um, I'm just going to cover the notes a little bit in this one because at the beginning we've got some G sharps. We've got A, so that's first finger on the G string. Now in the second bar we've got G sharp. So if you've got a first finger on your A, you're just going to move a tiny bit back for your G sharp. It's a very, very small change, very small. It's called a semitone. So a very small step, halfway step between the notes. Then after that, you've got your open G, so that's just your open string, no left hand needed. And then you've got another G sharp. So if you're a bit new to the G sharps and you're not feeling very confident, I would suggest doing a one on the A and then a one on the G sharp as well. Just so you're really confident that you're just sliding that first finger back slightly. Now if you are a little bit more confident or really confident with your G sharps, do a two on the A and then you've just got the one there for the G sharp. So no shifting required. So in variation three, um, I just want to go over those double stops. So that's in bar 71, um, where it says non-div, and I think you've probably got in your parts that it says that means that you play both strings at the same time. Now a good hack for this is to imagine that there's a string 
between the two strings that you need to play. So just do that. So we're playing, we've got the notes G on the bottom and D on the top. So imagine that you've got a string in between and that's the string you're aiming to play. So remember, relaxed arm, and then you put it on the string and just play the two strings at the same time. It's also a good idea, if you can think of this at the same time, to use a full hair on the double stops. It'll just help give a bit more of a fuller sound. Now, then in bar 76, you've got um, an accent and a sforzando on that, that pizzicato A, quaver. Now it's only a quaver, so it's quite short, but you've got to pack quite a lot into that one quaver. So let's just talk a little bit about doing pits. So maybe put your bows down. Get your right hand. You're just going to take your right hand thumb and put him or her on the side of the fingerboard. Then you're going to take your index finger, so your first finger, and let's just use the G string for now. We're going to pop him or her on the G string and pluck. Now, something to remember about pizzicato as well is it's not going this way. You're not going that way either, because if you do that way, you can hear there's a bit of a twang in the string. We don't want that. So try and remember that the motion of the arm is going to the side. So it's going this way. So this way. And remember to try and keep your thumb on the side of the fingerboard. It just gives it a bit more stability. So let's now add the left hand. Now when you add the left hand, and this isn't only for pizzicato, but when you add the left hand, by pressing the left hand down, you're making the string shorter. So you need to bear in mind that it will need a little bit more oomph, a bit more power to get the string to sound when you put the left hand down. The G open string is a bit more easy. It will react and respond more easily. When you put the first finger down, just practice trying to get the same kind of sound. So make sure your first finger is nice and nice and relaxed on the string. So we don't want any nice and relaxed, shoulder stable, relaxed. Yeah, do a little bit of, do some shoulder rotations just to keep us in a good shape. And also handy hint, when you're doing pizzicato and when you're doing your left hand, it's good to use the squishy parts of your fingers. So try, try not being too round and also try not being too flat. Try and use the pad, so the squishy part of your finger where, where there's a lot of flesh. You want to use that and it's the same with the pizzicato. Find the fleshy part of the finger and pits. Now, because this is a sport sound and an accent, I might allow you to take your thumb off if you want when you do it. So, just gives it a bit more welly. Don't worry too much if you hear a bit of a twang because it is a sport sando here. I just don't want it to be like this. So, you can probably do a better job than I can. Okay, so all the sport sando and the accent means is you need to give the note a bit of welly. It means like double the oomph than a normal accent. It's also a good tip um, to circle any um, dynamics, changes in tempo. So bar 76 is a good example. You've got a sudden change in the time signature. So it's now in three, four. So there's three beats in each bar. So if I were you, I'd just circle that a little bit, just so you remember that you're now counting three in a bar. And now we're looking at variation four. Now, all I'm going to say about this variation is just remember at the beginning of when you come in at bar 85, um, it says arco above the note. Now that means that you need to pick up your bow again. It means you, you play with the bow. So when you see the word arco, it means you're playing with the bow. When you see the word pits, you put the bow down and you use just your hand. So 
just remember that. Now, also take note that there's one of our letter V's above the note, which means you're starting on an up bow. So just make sure that in those bars rest you've got before, you prepare that up bow a couple of bars in advance so that you're nice and comfortable and ready to start. There's also a PP underneath, which means pianissimo. So that's even quieter than a piano. So you can really experiment with getting that floaty sound near the fingerboard. Now, the last thing I'll say here is at the end of that variation, you've got the word writ um, written above. And that means uh, ritardando, which means the music, the conductor will slow down there. So if I were you, I think that's a really important bit to circle. Um, and you can either write a glasses, meaning, oh, I need to really pay attention there. Or my preferred idea is to draw a snail just so that you remember this bit goes a bit slow, like a snail. Now in variation five, we've got the word pits again. So I'm sure now you can all tell me what that means. Um, so we're just using our hands, no bow necessary. Um, now I'm going to use this variation to talk to you about the importance of rests. So as you'll see in the first few bars, you've got a crotchet note and then a crotchet rest, a crotchet note, crotchet rest, crotchet note, crotchet rest. Now, they're not just, oh, they're bits where I just don't play. So I just zone out, I'm not going to listen to what anyone else is doing, I don't need to count, I just know I don't play there and then I come back in. Actually, the rests are equally as important as the notes, if not sometimes more important. Now, what you can use these rests for is getting prepared for the next bar. So if we start from the beginning, remember, right hand thumb, side of the fingerboard, index finger, fleshy palm, nice and ready. So we're also in the MP dynamic, which is mezzo piano, so it's quite quiet. I know there are lots of variations, it's hard to remember all of them. <laughs> I, I forget them as well. So just remember you're on the quiet side when you need to play this bit. So crotchet. Now in the rest, don't just go, okay, I'll just wait and then, oh, whoops, I'm a bit late for the next note. No, use the rest to prepare. So rest, be prepared. Always be alert, be thinking ahead. So use the rests to think ahead to prepare your pizzicato position. Now, moving on to variation six, this is the finger snapping variation, which is actually really fun because we don't really need to use our cellos at all. So, that's what we need to do with these finger snapping. Now, where you can see those now funny notes that have sort of a uh, stem and then a, a cross, that's just the rhythm of where you need to play the finger snaps. So the finger snaps are a crotchet, so only last for one beat, and there's rest in between. So you've got rest, 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 rest. Now, if you can't finger snap, um, maybe just try very gently tapping the side of your cello. Rest, rest, rest. finale so we're near the end now uh, in general we've covered a lot of now what's in the finale we've got our arco mezzo forte staccato quavers um, we've got uh, mezzo piano piano now we haven't covered a crescendo which um, is a really fun one it means that the sound needs to grow to be louder so Let's just talk about bar 161, where we've got that minim tied onto another minim, E. So it's the third finger on the C string. So C, D, first finger, third finger. Got your E. Now, with this E, the tie beneath the two notes means that you add the two notes together and you play them as one long note. So a minim lasts for two beats. So we've got 
two minims that are tied together. So two plus two is four. So that means those two bars last for four beats altogether. So we start piano, so near the fingerboard, and then we're going to crescendo at the end of the note. So you need to save the bow. I can't emphasize this enough because it's very easy to do this. And you start whooshing with the bow. You whoosh and then before you know it, you're at the point you've still got to be holding it for another two beats. So the best advice I can give you for this bit is to practice saving the bow. So you start and get louder. So I'll start again. In fact, the bow should probably be going slower at the beginning. And now that is a hard thing to do. So maybe it would help to think about splitting the bow in two. So if we do the first minim, half the bow, the other minim, half the bow. So like this, one, two, halfway through, one, two. So things to remember. So let's just recap the things we've done today. Staccato, short notes. So it means we don't use a lot of bow. Accents, they need oomph and more bow. Dynamics, the basic dynamics, we've got piano and we've got forte. So piano, soft, forte, loud. Remember piano is played near the fingerboard. Forte is played near the bridge. And anything in between, if you're playing mezzo piano, still nearish the fingerboard, mezzo forte, nearer the bridge. Um, remember to relax the arm. This is at all times, but especially near the bridge. Nice relaxed arm. You want to really be able to feel comfortable. You want to feel like you're really having to force anything. Very relaxed. Remember, keep the shoulders back and balanced as well. That's a really important one to remember. Do some shoulder rotations to remember. It's a good one. And remember to save your bow on long notes. So no whooshing, no whooshing off. And a top tip for that is dividing the bow so that you're counting if you've got, for example, like we had just now, two minims um, tied together. So four beats to two minims, first half, uh, sorry, <laughs> two beats in the first half two beats in the second half. That works as well. Um, practice with a metronome as well. Um, especially for orchestra, it's good because it just gets you really, really comfortable with the speed and the tempo and um, how the piece is going to feel as well at tempo. That's a good one to do. And uh, finally, I just want to say as well that feel free and make sure you write whatever you need to write for yourself in your part, they're your part. So circle away, write what you need to write. If you need to write piano again, just to make sure you really notice it, do it. Okay, they're really good um, ways of then when you're in your rehearsal, you can see everything you've written, you're like, right, I know, oh yes, I remember. Uh, we've been three, four here. Um, oh, I need to always remember that's forte, so I need to play near the bridge. You can just write bridge above it. Um, and lastly, uh, Probably most importantly, I just want to say that you are by no means expected to remember all of this at all. You need to do as much as what you can do at this moment in time, right now, at the stage you're at, um, and what feels right for you. So take from this tutorial what you need. You don't have to take everything, you don't have to listen to me droning on. You can, you can skip bits afterwards and say, oh, I, I need to look at variation six. What, what, did, what, what was said there? Um, and most, most importantly, you want to remember to always try and enjoy your practice, always love the music and always have 